Hello and welcome as we dig into our Old Testament reading for this past Sunday. 1 Kings 19, 1-8. Yes, our Gospel reading continues the discourse from Jesus where he's talking about how he is the bread of life and that the bread that he gives for the life of the world is his flesh. It's very specific. But as we go to the Old Testament reading again, we have another Old Testament background where, well, we've got the prophet of God in a difficult situation where he is being hunted down by the authorities that are supposed to be the reflection of God's rule and reign in the world, but are not. And along the way, the Lord provides both food for him to eat as not only strength for him, but for his journey throughout life. This is part of parcel of that Old Testament image of um, faith as a journey. Um, not, not, not like the song, um, Life is a Highway, but, but um, faith as a journey by which our Lord leads us and he strengthens us through these gifts where that heavenly food, you know, the Holy Supper of our Lord, is more than just a remembrance meal. It is Christ our Lord being given to us in order to sustain us and, and, and lead us to that gift of eternal life. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we take a look at our reading from 1 Kings today, bless us as we not only chew on and reflect on you know, your giving and your leading and, and, the, and the way in which you continue to provide for us even throughout our own earthly lives, but um, help us to see within these accounts and these stories your gift and your providence fulfilled in Christ. All this we pray for in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 8, um, where we're dealing with somewhere in the 800s before Christ. Ahab is the king of Israel, and he's generally not described as a very positive king. He's, he's, um, there, there was not only moral, but religious and spiritual decline under his kingship. And his wife Jezebel also gets a bad name because she, well, she brings in a lot of the... the, <clears throat> the a, a lot of the pagan worship, um, the worship of, of, of the Baals into the Baals, the, the foreign gods, into the, the context of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so neither of these two are necessarily on the high books as being faithful, um, faithful rulers. Um, and, and as we hear this, you know, the Lord responds and answers and knows this. And then as the scriptures recorded, in the same way as the Lord will take a look at all of the rulers of our land and all the people that hold various positions of public leadership about which ones are faithful and which ones are not. Um, this is something that as we read this, it becomes one of these reminders um, for us um, as we take a look at it, where we sometimes think that we have to fix it. Well, yeah, we can and we should by voting and voting our conscience and voting according with our faith form of conscience formed by faith. Absolutely. But as we hear this and as we take a look at this, sometimes we, we worry more than what we need to because we somehow think that God is, is um, has fallen asleep at the wheel? Not really. Never has. Never has. But as we begin <clears throat> chapter 19, um, we begin with Ahab and then Jezebel and well, we're dealing with the prophet Elijah who is the prophet of God but but um, he's not necessarily a favorite because he was very bold in calling out um, social and moral problems. So Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Oh dear. Okay, this is not a biblical text saying that, you know, you as a pastor, because you figured that all these people are evil, should go out there and slash them to bits and pieces. Um, we have plenty of New Testament examples where we're reminded, do not live by the sword and leave the judgment up to God. So Jezebel who was very much a, um, you know, a follower of this Canaanite kind of a religion, and, and these false prophets that had been killed, she's understandably ticked off. And so then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So very deliberate threat. <clears throat> um Here's the thing, because Elijah lived to be, um, you know, a good ripe old age, and as we read through the, the, the scriptures, he's also snatched up into heaven um, without facing death, which is the the irony of this whole passage. As we listen to this, um, 
you know, it, it becomes both a reflection that we need to be bold in proclaiming God's word and living our faith within our society. But also, don't be surprised if we face um, face accusations, because, you know, if we followed the canon of many of these these uh, historically Christian churches nowadays that, um, and, and re read it into here, basically Jezebel threatens him, says, okay, well maybe we'll do it differently, and and, and so that so that Elijah caved and basically says, okay, well you can worship, you know, Baal or do whatever you want. And, and that's never been the case of, of the, the prophets of God and the ones that are talked about as the true prophets of the Lord. So here, as we look into this text, Elijah is, you know, being sustained by God's word and spirit in order to preach and teach God's word clearly. So, but at the same time, he's not immune to the same things that you and I face. The very next verse catches that. Then he was afraid. Okay, are we ever afraid? Do we ever buckle? And this is not only for adults, this is for teenagers, for kids. Do we ever um, have those moments where we're based on peer pressure and what everyone else is doing, we're so worried that we don't want to stick out like a sore thumb and then we want to try and, you know, um, conform. And this is where a lot of um, the, the extremes of our society, both on the woke left as well as on the far right, want to... Uh, they, they weaponize um, the sense of conformity, um, compassion, in order to try and twist people out of standing on God's word in order to be more like them, so that you're on the right side of history, is the phrase that runs around. And, and Elijah certainly wasn't on the right side of history, if you would want to read it in this context. He was afraid. Um, and when we have those moments as well, it's not that our faith is dried up, but it's always this reminder as we look at this, and this is where we can look at Elijah as a good example for our faith today. Don't let the the, the cultural pressure, the the um, sociocultural bullying, um, the peer pressure that comes through media and social media, um, chase you away from that which is true in God's word that we hold on to, not only the law, what is right and what is wrong, but then also the gospel. That we don't um, fudge on those because with the gospel comes that gift of eternal life. With Jesus comes that gift of eternal life. Um, no matter how much people nowadays would like to try and redefine Jesus in, in all kinds of strange ways or the way in which, you know, um, from the Olympics opening ceremony where... <clears throat> You know, as much as the, the, the apologies were flowing, they're trying to say it wasn't actually the Lord's Supper. There was something put out prior to saying this is the gay, gay Last Supper. Um, so, the, so that there was a very deliberate connection made. And then all of a sudden, after the criticisms start coming, all those things are being pulled off. So that it's like, oh, no, no, no. And, and then that wonderful apology. Oh, well, certainly we didn't mean to offend. And if you were offended, that certainly wasn't our intention and all these sorts of things so that it turns into a form of gaslighting saying, well, you know, you just don't understand it the way we do. And so you must be the ones that, you know, weren't quite getting it and getting it right. Well, no, we're not that dumb. As we dig into this, we face that kind of a context in the same way that Elijah faced that context. And part of the call is for us to stand firm in that gift as we well celebrate it as our Lord holds us in this gift of eternal life, because the other things don't lead us there. So as we keep going on, you know, he was afraid and then he arose. Notice what it says. And he ran for his life. So it wasn't just a little bit nervous, but he got over it. He ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. So he's left the northern territory, outside of the territory where Ahab and Je Jezebel have control, goes into the kingdom of Judah and left his servant there. So here it goes into hiding in the neighboring country. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die, okay, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. As we hear this, <clears throat> this is how deeply the, the, the pressure got to him, um, and the persecution got to him, and the words and the bullying got to him. And as we hear this, it becomes one of these reflections for us. Do we ever feel like where we're stuck between either giving up 
which becomes the default within our society, or just going and hiding. So not only does he go to Beersheba, but then goes into the wilderness, which likely means heading east into the territories of what would be modern-day Jordan, okay, um, and, and basically goes and hides out. And, and here's here's part of the all the fun stuff, because this is where the people of Israel wandered. Many of them died in the desert, and so this is part of that reflection. You know, I'm no better than they were. Let me die out here just like they did, okay. But wilderness also within biblical context, especially the Old Testament, is the place where the demons, the devils, live. Okay, and, and then there's all kinds of all kinds of um, you know associations and passages. And this is the place of temptation. This is the place uh, where where death consumes. And so basically, he goes out there and he flees from not only the north going down to Judah, but then going and fleeing even from Judah into these deserted areas and calls out to the Lord saying, you know, it's enough, it's too much for me. So that as he hears this and as he says this, he basically says, Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. Might as well let me die here because if Jezebel and Ahab are going to put me to the sword, then might as well just let me die out here. What a burden. What a burden as, as we take a listen. And I know sometimes we look at it and say, oh, well, sure, he's saying, what a burden. What about all the things going on in my life? No, we'll take a look at it. You know, we have house and home. We have um, a country where people are taken care of. That's true. Um, we don't have death threats like Christians in Middle Eastern countries or throughout various parts of Africa or into Hindu and, and, um, Hindu and, and Buddhist countries where where Christians are routine, routinely mocked, persecuted, disadvantaged, and even killed for the name of Jesus. <sighs> okay, that would be more like what Ahab, or what, what Jeremiah is going through, or Je Jeremiah, Elijah is going through. But <clears throat> as he sets himself down, okay, again, we've got other examples where, you know, even Moses had that problem as the people grumbled against him, and finally he goes and stands before the Lord and says, these are your people, they're not my people, and might as well kill me right now because this is just nuts. Um, there are times where we in our faith are driven to those extents, out of fear, out of worry, out of, um, you know, just just feeling like we're isolated and alone, and yet... Um, both for Elijah and for Moses um, and for the faithful never alone that's part of the baptismal promise too where he says and I will be with you to the end of the age that's a promise tied to baptism so that as we struggle in our own day and age um, as we wrestle together with you know our earthly pilgrimage with within a world that again seems to be turning itself upside down first of all God has not relinquished control. He knows fully what's going on, both inside you and around in the world. But then also, um, you know, the Lord continues to provide. And this is where this passage goes. So, <clears throat> what does dear old Elijah do? He, and he went and laid down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, angel, a messenger touched him, arise and eat. Here he's left everything behind, gone out into the desert where there is nothing. Okay, sort of like the people of Israel last week as they wandered in the desert and said, well, you know, it would have been so much better if we were here in, in you know, back in Egypt, or at least we had leeks and meat pots, but now we got nothing. And then they said, you know, perhaps it's better that we die out here. And maybe that's what Moses' plan was, that we just go out here and die. Well, here Elijah goes and says... You know, I'm just going to flee, and it's best that I just die. And what does the Lord do? He sends a messenger, an angel, and wakes him and says, Arise and eat. What's he supposed to eat? Well, it's not the manna this time, but the Lord provides. Okay. And Elijah looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. So the Lord provided. Okay food and water. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Notice he says the journey isn't done. Okay. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the street of that, uh, sorry, in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, 
the mount of God. And then he keeps going on. This is a fascinating, fascinating episode as we listen, because as we take a look at our lives, so often we want to give up. Um, when we take a look at church, you know, it isn't what it was in the 1950s. No, it isn't. Okay. Um, and yet, at the same time, our journey isn't finished. Arise and eat. Take and eat, actually, are the words that Jesus says, where he is that bread of life that strengthens us, that gift from heaven that comes down from heaven, even in the wilderness of this world, to feed us not just for an earthly kind of existence, but to feed us with the heavenly food and the heavenly existence, which is where Jesus goes in next week's gospel reading. Arise and eat, because our journey isn't done, but he strengthens us for it. So that for Elijah, at least, he had strength for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb on the Mount of God. This is that fascinating, fascinating Old Testament passage, which not only reflects 40 days and 40 nights, okay? Well, a little bit of Noah and the Ark, but then also Jesus, um, where he's tempted out in the wilderness. The wilderness again, where it ends with the very same, the very same kind of a thing. Um, you know, if you're so hungry and you're the, really the Son of God, why don't you command these stones here to become bread so that you can be fed? Okay, tempting him to be, you know, to do what, you know, live according to his human appetites and all these sorts of things. And notice Jesus' response. It's like, first of all, away from me, devil. But then also, um, it's the word of God. And Jesus being the word of God made flesh. The bread that came to the desert. The bread that feeds us in his flesh. Um, the bread that we celebrate in the same way that the New Testament church did, in the same way that the early church did, all the way up until the 1500s, where all of a sudden you had people with harebrained ideas saying, well, it couldn't possibly be the body and blood of Jesus. Well, that's, you know, relatively new innovation in the way in which people think about it, where they cut away, you know, Jesus' own words and say, well, it couldn't be, it's just a remembrance meal, and we got to make faith more real and active in other ways. Well, here's the danger. It's not what Christ says, so we're not following the words of Christ. But then also, if Jesus really says that this is his flesh, which he gives for the life of the world, that's the bread of heaven. Um, and then we say it couldn't possibly be, and so i got to find it some other way. Um, it's like the people wandering in the desert that decided to build golden calf instead and said well we'll worship this instead because Moses is gone and you know all these other things they were judged and they fell they died again as we listen going back to Elijah Ahab Jezebel you know the confrontation between Elijah the prophet of God and the prophets of Baal <clears throat> the Lord provided food for him the Lord provided strength with that, again, bread and that nourishment from heaven. And as we hear this, it becomes, again, part and parcel of that biblical understanding that, you know, even as we wander through this life as strangers in this world because we've been called to a heavenly, heavenly citizenship, hold on to that gift. <clears throat> hold on to Christ. Let's continue to seek that gift of that bread of heaven, that bread of life, namely the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless us so that as we face not only the similar struggles that Elijah did back then, that and as we wrestle with our own fears, that you know we would be strengthened by his word and strengthened and always draw strength from the sacraments for our journey of faith. God's peace be with you. Amen.